Hi there, in this video, we will talk about the uh, introduction to fraud examination and forensic accounting. And uh, first of all, we need to look at the definition of fraud examination and forensic accounting. And what are the relationship between the fraud examination, forensic accounting and auditing? And then we start talking about the process of how to run a fraud examination and who could be the fraudster. Is it the organization or the board of directors or the management or the employees or somebody from outside like the competitors, the customers, the suppliers? And we as examiners, we need to look for the red flags that should give us hints and tips that there is some kind of fraud is running and we need to go for further investigation. So with this in mind, let us go to the presentation. So although the title of the chapter says red flags and targeted risk assessment, but because it's the first lecture in this course, I will start talking about the definition. So you, uh, or let us agree first on the definition of fraud before we start looking at the red flags. Uh, any fraud should have first something false going on and this false, it could be like a statement in the financial statement, or it could be actual uh, uh, action like stealing something. And there is a knowledge from the fraudster, there is something going on. And there is an intent that the fraudster is committing this uh, false statement to get some benefit from the victim. Because we need to differentiate between fraud an error. In error, we do something wrong, but we don't have intention. But in fraud, we do something wrong, but we have intent to get some gains behind this false statement. What are the major uh, sections of fraud? It could be actual stealing of asset, which we call it asset misappropriation, like stealing inventory items, stealing cash, or it could be corruption and abuse. And here the employee might use his authority as a manager to get some kind of bribe from the supplier to give him the bidding or to get some kind of bribe from the customers to give him better advantage than other customers. And this we call it corruption. The financial statement fraud is trying to manipulate the numbers to show that the financial statement looks good for the investors and the customers. And finally, there is some other uh, fraudulent statements the person can commit. But in our chapter here, we will talk mainly about the financial information uh, fraud. On the other hand, we need to look for a definition for forensic accounting. And forensic accounting is different from fraud examination because forensic accounting, it goes into personal issues like divorce, and it could go into kind of like advisory services and litigation in the court. So fraud, we discover the act. Forensic accounting, it takes this act into the legal system and try to either find a resolution or intermediation or to find some kind of judgment from the judge. There is a non-fraud forensic accounting and it goes into like damage claim made by plaintiffs or workplace issues, asset and business valuation, or even insurance and divorce. So here, the forensic accounting, it goes beyond the actual fraud. It goes into personal issues, insurance, and that's totally fine. And we need to keep in mind the difference between the two different fields. Uh, in this course, I'm trying to build up your skill set either to run fraud examination or to run forensic accounting. And number one, we need to understand in this kind of profession is how to develop the technical competency. The technical competency comes from the awareness of what we should do, and this is what we cover in this course, 
and also the software that we might use, either idea like what we are using in this course or other software that we might use to build up our technical skills. Then we need to understand the investigative proficiency, which is the managerial skills, how to run interview, how to talk to the fraudster, how to become neutral so you don't become or you don't create in, in legal obligations against the examiner. And finally, how to develop the skeptical mindset, which we call it thinking critically, which means we don't accept everything at the face value, but we always ask why, why it happens. And this is what we mean by uh, critical thinking. There is a strong relation between the forensic accounting, fraud examination and auditing in auditing, we usually look at the financial statements and we try to find any risk of material misstatement, which goes above the materiality level. And this kind of terminology, we discuss it in auditing. So I'm not gonna talk about it, but what you need to know in this course that in auditing, we mainly focus at the financial statements and make sure that these statements have been prepared according to the US GAAP or the IFRS or any accounting principles. But in fraud examination, we try to look for some kind of intention to steal something or to manipulate the numbers for getting some benefits from the financial statement users. So fraud is creating manipulation in the financial statements for the company to get some benefit. In forensic financial, here we go into litigation process and the impact of this litigation process on the company and the economy. So we talk about the impact of this damage on the economy, on the family life and the insurance. So there is a strong relation between, between uh, uh, those items. And in our course, we will talk about fraud examination and forensic accounting. Uh, as I said, the types of fraud, it could cover the occupational fraud and the abuse. White collar crime, here we talk about the uh, manipulation of numbers by the employees in the financial statements. The organizational crime is trying to steal the intellectual property of certain product and try to steal the, the information from the competitor, try to take a market share, or try to make monopoly in the market. And this we call it organizational crime. Organize the crime, it means a collusion between two or three different parties. Even if there is a good internal control system, those people, they come together or those organization, they come together to organize a crime. We call it collusion or organized crime. Uh, the fraud could, could go into tort or breach of duty or several litigation. Uh, these issues, we cover it in business law class, so I'm not gonna discuss it here, but you just need to know the type of uh, fraud and their impact in the legal system. When a fraud could happen, the fraud could happen if three elements they meet together. First of all, there is some kind of pressure or motivation that happened to the fraudster. And the fraudster could be a certain individual or it could be a company. And this person or this company might have incentive beyond committing the fraud or they might go into financial pressure. And because of that, they go for fraud. If this element exists by itself, it doesn't create fraud. But there should be another element, which we call it opportunities, which means weakness in the internal control. It means there is no control happening at all. And this is where the auditor should interfere to make sure that there is intercontrol to prevent the fraud from happening, which we call it fraud deterrence. If the pressure happens and the opportunity happens, those are not good enough for the fraud to happen. We need some kind of justification or rationalization, which means that either the individual should find peace with himself 
from committing this act of fraud, find good reason for that. So for example, if the fraudster has financial pressure from his family, like for example, doesn't have enough finance to pay for the tuition of the college of his, uh, one of his sons. So he needs money to pay for the tuition. And there is weak internal control in his company. So this reason inside the fraudster mind might push him to steal the money from the company to pay for the tuition. So here we see the three elements happening. First, there is a need. Second, there is a weak internal control. Third, there is a good reason for that. If those three elements come together, the fraud will happen. We as auditor or examiner, we cannot control either the pressure or the rationalization because those two, they happen inside the mind of the fraudster or the mind of the organization. But what we can do is to create good internal control. And this is what we are gonna discuss in this chapter to prevent the fraud from happening. Why the fraud happens? Because of four reasons. One of them, I said, it could be money. And this is the to meet the financial needs of the family. And the financial needs could be like a school tuition. It could be medical expenses. It could be other needs for the family. But there is other reasons. One of them is ideology. And this is very clear in the story of Robin Hood is a stealing from the rich to give to the poor. So this is also fraud, even if, <clears throat> excuse me. Even if there is a, a certain ideology, it, it's not a good justification for the fraud. The third one is coercion. And here the person is using his authority to uh, enforce the other person to listen to him. And here we try to work with the employees and the manager because some of the managers, they make collusions to use their power in inappropriate way. The fourth one is the egocentric or the ego where the person try to go beyond his means which means try to go for a higher lifestyle without enough uh, support, like very small salary, but big peer pressure from his friends that can motivate the person to steal the money to become at the same level of his friends. Uh, those four different elements could be good reasons for a person to steal, from, uh, to steal money. But then the question remains, why most of the people, they don't commit crimes? Number one, because of the legal punishment. If they have been discovered, there is like some kind of years in prison or financial payment, there is some kind of punishment. Uh, another one, they would like to act properly so they can get rewarded by their companies. Another one, to act in a just and moral manner according to the society standard because once they are discovered by the society, they might be isolated or intimidated by the society. Uh, now, let us look at this diagram that explains who can commit the fraud, either from outside the company or inside the company. The outside fraud, it could happen from the market and it could happen from the customers, or the competitors or the suppliers. So as you can see here, the, cust the external, it could happen here from the uh, stock market. And this could be like extortion to the company or bribery and so on. Or it could happen from the customer where the customer can give kickbacks to some of the employees to get some advantage, or they can use the company for money laundering reasons. Uh, the competitor as well, they try to play with the price collusion or they try to steal the intellectual property. Another party that could happen here, it could happen from the supplier where they can make secretive agreement with the procurement department to get the deals from the company. 
So the fraud could come from outside, but the majority of the fraud cases comes from inside the company, starting from the board of directors here, because the board has access to confidential information. They might use this confidential information to buy or sell the shares. And this one, we call it insider trading, where the people, they get some kind of information and use it for their own benefit to make financial profit. Other things like conflicts of interest and a stock option and so on. Other thing could happen from the management. And as you can see here, the management has long list of fraud uh, 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 perspectives that they might commit. First of all, they can make override to their decision. They can make some kind of revenue manipulation to show the board of directors that they are eligible for income at the end of the year. They might actually steal the cash or the inventory or other assets. They might make over evaluation to the assets through the depreciation. So if they manipulate the depreciation, this will be uh, uh, over evaluation of the assets and other things they might do. Employees also, they can steal the cash. They can steal the inventory. They can come into a secretive agreement, which we call it collusion and so on. So we need to know that the, the, the area for examining the fraud is very big. And for the examiner to identify the fraud, we need to identify where the fraud is and who could be the fraudster. Would it be somebody from outside the company or inside the company? <clears throat> To eliminate the fraud, or let me say, to minimize the occurrence of the fraud, we need to create a corporate governance structure that control the management, control the audit committee, control all the employees by having internal auditor inside the company and external auditor that comes outside from outside to check what's going on inside the company. Uh, the management responsibility here, as you can see, they can create override, which means they put the policy, but they make exception for the policy. And they can come into collusion where two or three individuals or organizations, they come together to make secretive agreement for their benefits. The board of directors, they need to create an audit committee, which is coming from independent board members to investigate all the issues that might happen and build up internal audit department, which goes into each department and they run internal audit once every quarter to make sure that the operation is running properly and there's good internal control. And this is what I'm going to discuss in this chapter, that we need to address each role of those parties. At the end of every year, the external auditor will come to check. There is a good internal control system. There is an internal audit department. There is an audit committee that's supervising the internal audit. And there is a board of directors that doesn't abuse the information for their own benefits and there is no override or collusion from the management. And if there is a collusion of override, there should be a good justification. So this is what we call it corporate governance structure that should happen in the company. <clears throat> what is the main role of the management responsibility? Because once we identify the responsibilities of the management, it will be easy for us to understand where the fraud could happen. Number one, the management, they meet uh, uh, the strategic objective of the company, the operational, the performance of the company. So the management, they put the strategic goal where the company should go 10 years from now. And what are the day-to-day -day operation that they should make to achieve this long-term objective? And evaluation for these a short-term objective on a quarterly or semi-annual or annual basis. So they put the measure performance, which we call it usually KPI or balance scorecard, where we identify the 
expected performance, the actual performance, and the difference between them. And then they communicate the results into the audit committee, the board of directors, and their annual meeting. And here, the management is uh, controlled by the statement of audit standard number one, and they should create internal control based on committee of a sponsoring organization, which we call it course of framework. It's the responsibility of the management to create internal control. At the end of the year, they prepare the financial statements. They present it to the auditor. And this is what I mean by fair representation of financial statements and provide any information the auditor need to run his audit and make sure that everything is in compliance with the accounting principles. And there is no, uh, let me say, fraud uh, hands. So this is mainly the responsibilities of the management. Then where the risk could happen, as I said, the risk could happen if the auditor, while he's making his audit, he find out that the management made some kind of override to the rules. Good example, if the management set up the threshold for any order to be approved by the purchasing manager if the order is $5,000 and below. But if the auditor finds out that there is one purchase order, maybe like 4,999, and this kind of figure is repeated several times, and because everything is above $5,000, will go to the senior management for the approval. If we find that there is multiple orders right below the threshold, we know there is some kind of fraud could happen by the purchasing manager. Or if we find the purchasing manager approving an order above $5,000, which we call it override. So here we see that there is a hint for fraud commitment. But if we find a good justification for this override, that should be fine. If not, we know that there is a hint for fraud here. So the internal control cannot control the management override. It means that the internal control cannot detect it and prevent it, and the prevention is not possible. <clears throat> so this is what we mean by the override. The risk of the management override and senior management collusion, uh, here we need to identify like three issues. How the auditor finds out the management override, number one from the journal entries. And this is what you can see it here. Journal entries recorded in books and records. For every journal entry, there usually is a voucher along with several documents that explains how the journal entry was made and the reasons for that. If he found journal entries above the threshold and there is no clear clarification, so then we know that there is override. Another thing, the auditor has to check the estimates. What do you mean by the estimates? Like depreciation. Sometimes we don't do anything in purchasing or sales, but we can come to the fixed assets and we manipulate the depreciation because if we manipulate the depreciation, the expenses might be lower and the value of the assets might be higher and this will be manipulation in the financial statements. So the auditor has to check that the estimates or the percentage of the depreciations are constant throughout the years. The third one, if the auditor find single transaction during the year, that has no explanation. Like for example, unexpected sales to the customer who doesn't have any relationship between him and the company throughout the years before. So if I find the company is making sales and sometime in June they sell to client X who doesn't have any history, huge amount of sales without any credit approval or something like this. Or they made sales to one of the board of directors member or the one of the senior management or one of the shareholders without fair justification for a discount to that shareholder or board of directors. So the single transactions that doesn't have 
good clarification and it's beyond the norms of the company, it could be a red flag for uh, fraud. <clears throat> so here comes the role of the external auditor to check what the management has done and what he should do. First of all, the auditor has to set a materiality level. What do we mean by materiality level? We take maybe the assets or the net income and we multiply by a certain percentage. And we say everything above this level will be checked on a random sample basis. Everything below this level, it will be ignored. So for example, if the company is making net income of maybe $1 million, we say, let us take 30%, which is $300. And then we say, if we find sales above this $300,000, like certain transactions, we take sample of this one and then we'll try to investigate. It. So this one, we call it materiality level. Then we start to provide the management reasonable assurance, not absolute because the auditor cannot provide absolute assurance, but we provide reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free from materiality misstatement or material misstatement. Material misstatement, it means huge misstatement. And how can the auditor do that? the auditor can run some analysis like ratio analysis, like trend analysis, like reasonableness analysis, try to identify the, those kind of transactions. And then the auditor has to build up his expectation levels and the actual levels and see where is the gap between what he expected and what he actually saw. And this one, we call it expectations gap the gap between the auditor's expectation and the actual numbers. And then at the end, the auditor will make some kind of fair attestation that the financial statements are presented in a reasonable way according to the, <clears throat> the accounting principles like the US gap or the IFRS. And based on that, the auditor will make his report. Uh, I will stop here <clears throat> so you can get a, a what we call it, um, a rest for your mind. And then I will continue the presentation in another video. But what you need to, the takeaway from this presentation is, what is the definition of fraud? And number two, what is the definition of forensic accounting? Number three, what is the relation between fraud examination, forensic accounting, and auditing? And then we need to identify the three elements that could create fraud, starting by opportunity, pressure, and justification, the categories of fraud, and then who can commit the fraud. It could come from outside the company, like market, customers, suppliers, and so on, or it could come from inside the company, like board of directors, audit committee, management, employees, and what is the role of the management and what is the role of the external order? If you have any question, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, also, I encourage you next to this video is to read the textbook. Reading the textbook will give you more information than what I provide in my lecture. I'm trying to make my lecture as detailed as possible, but I cannot let, literally say everything in the book. So I encourage you to go through the book material and this will help you to do the quizzes and to do the fraud case. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.